the studio of your mom's basement comes a podcast by two idiots and a revolving door of legends and has from the oldest university in Texas. This is Purple, Gold, and well, Getting Well, once old. again, we did it. We gave their little hearts so much hope and they get so excited uh, and then we just crushed it. <laughs> but it's 2022 in HSU. Oh, they definitely suck. still suck. I, I have to say, being in Lubbock, Texas at like... so. Let me actually just lead into that weekend for you. Not even at the game, and I'm as tired as if I were. I was in College Station Thursday night filming a music video at Northgate where I felt like Steve Buscemi, you know, like, hello, fellow kids. Um, Self-plug. Everyone watch for that video. It'll be out soon. Um, But, yeah, I was like, I got home, you know, it's it's past like 2, 3 a.m. I get up the next morning. I do some work. And then Nathan Berryman shows up at my house here in Temple, and uh, we load up the truck and we drive all the way to Lubbock. It was a six hour drive, went through Abilene on the way. And we were like, dude, it's almost like we need to just stop and mess with something again. (laughs) But we were tired of driving. So we powered through. We stayed up late in Lubbock till like 2 a.m. Like we were college kids again. So needless to say, my voice is almost gone and I had to perform a concert the following night. So the next day we're at the Texas Tech game and I didn't realize UMHB kicked off. Like I, Like I got a text from Andy. I I said something about the tech game. He's like, I don't care right now. And I'm like, oh, it's past six o'clock. That's why he doesn't care. And so all like all the updates I could get were from y'all, but it clearly was not going well at first. So we thought we were like getting our butts kicked or something just based on the vague text y'all were sending. Dude, that was number one. I I got invited to go on that trip uh, and I couldn't go. Um, but I don't know if I could have survived if I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, what's Murta? I, I'm, I'm too old for this, I'm too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but more power to you. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So I, I was at home. I watched it, uh, just on my couch and, um, it was stressful. It was stressful. Yeah. It was wild, and the game the game took uh, too many shots of Jägermeister. Uh, <laughs> Can we leave that in here? <laughs> yeah, uh, awesome. We're old. Yeah, we, was, we can do that. Yeah, back and forth, incredible. I will say, uh, in Lubbock, it was funny because without being able to really, because the phone was the internet wasn't great on our phones because we're in a big yeah. college football stadium. So we're we're at this game that is going to be the last time Texas probably plays Tech in Lubbock ever, and. It, the first time I was kind of surprised the fans were not as uh, rowdy in like a like we hate you kind of way as I thought they would be. But we were also above the student section so we could see they were chanting, but it was muffled. So it could have been the most profane thing ever and we wouldn't have known. But let me tell you that second half, because the sun, it was one of those the sun moved over the state and it was almost just like the earth stopped rotating. It was just beaming down on us. It was hot. So both like all the fans in that stadium try to go hide in the corridors during halftime to get some shade. And I mean, you talk about, you t- it was like a post game celebration already happening. The Texas fans were just, it was like the parade was about to come through. They were so happy. And honestly, it looked like it was like 30 something to 17. And I was like, oh, I can't deal with these people right now. And so <laughs> I can't get the UMHB score. I get occasional texts from you and Andy looking like we're getting our butts kicked. Yeah. We go back in the stands and then tech and Texas going to overtime. And I'm like, this is going to be one of those blood pressure weekends. I can already tell. And so we get out of there. Tech had won. It was just like the celebration flipped. I mean, the, the streets, people are like chanting and all this stuff down the streets. It was, it was an awesome thing to see, yeah. but we get back to the hotel and I open my phone. I'm like, okay, now let's check. And I see the final score. I was like, this wasn't close at all. We destroyed those fools again. Did, did you end up ever getting to see the the fact that we scored 20 points in like yeah. 45 seconds? It was like that that second quarter was really the blowout. It the was, rest of it, it was, was just eight. The crowd was going insane. The team really believed. Uh, they like they were making big offensive plays that, okay, you get one big throw, whatever. You get lucky. But then they make another one and another one. I'm like, do they really believe yeah. and um but no we we marched down we scored a touch i'm tr- yeah let me get this right we scored a touchdown we missed the extra point mm-hmm. and then they get the ball in the very first play they fumble we just scoop it up we run it back for a touchdown all right we've got some momentum they get the ball back again and the exact same thing happens again drop the ball <laughs> run it in for a touchdown and at that point they died 
yeah. the, the crowd died, the team died, the game was over at that point. It, they, they lost mm-hmm. all morale. It was over. Well, I haven't even told you this part. And here's the funny, and I haven't told Andy either, the funniest part of that, by the time, like we had done sound check for the concert and everything. And folks, this is also why I was tired. After all those late nights I told you about, I had to go play a concert till 1.30 in the morning after that. So we have sound check. We're done, and I'm reading the stats. I'm reading Twitter. I'm reading what y'all have said. And I'm following these fumble recoveries and missed points. And I'm looking up at the TV in this bar we're playing. And AM and Arkansas are literally reenacting everything that happened in the UMHB game. It's the weirdest thing. But oh, anyway, that was, you know, Twitter's mostly dumb and stupid. Oh, yeah. It's every once in a while, when everybody is tweeting about the same thing, it can be such a fun place. Oh, yeah. And I have not had that much fun on Twitter, maybe <laughs> ever. Uh, because there were just UMHP fans coming out everywhere, just yeah. all like dunking on the HSU. <laughs> It, I, saw, it I like the uh, really tweet, the Globetrotter fun. tweet you put out. Yeah, I just or the Vincent <laughs> Vincent <laughs> Van Gogh. Where the they're the Vincent Van Gogh of finding no, new artistic I ways. I, I think win. I just texted y'all that. <laughs> I thought I saw it on Twitter. Oh, uh, maybe I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, but yeah, everyone was hilarious. I was just retweeting everybody. <laughs> well, moving from HSU bashing, which will never get old, to today. Yeah, speaking guest, of the Panhandle. Yeah. <laughs> the, well, another uh, long trip. We are going to talk to somebody that I met in high school today. And so uh, we are going to talk to Grant Hickman and we will bring you that interview now. Awesome. Man, now I got to now I got to watch my language. Now we got to be professional. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Tyler, you want to intro us or me or what do you want to do? Uh, why don't you start us off today? Cool. All right. Well, I'm just going to jump in and say that uh, during the two year time period that Tyler kind of was twisting my arm to do a UMHB Where Are They Now podcast. Um, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, if we did this, who would we invite? And one of the first names that popped in my head was today's guest. And so after like a year of doing this podcast, I'm pretty stoked that we're able to do this. Um, mainly because, and I didn't realize this until I was about to log on, I texted Tyler and I'm like, dude, I just realized I met our interviewee 20 years ago. <laughs> it didn't even, I didn't even do that math in my head till today. So um, am I frozen? Because the two of you are like grinning at me frozen. <laughs> if Aaron, I, sw- we lost you. I moved rooms and then I just <laughs> get a pop up says your internet's unstable. That was a great- I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. And that one's definitely on you. Cause we were just able to chat just fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I'm at, I'm gonna do it, Grant. I'm gonna switch to a hot spot here, and hopefully that will power us through this thing. Man, I hope that works. And you know All what right. sucks with this is you're you're the one who's recording, so it's not like I, I can know. even just like jump might in and, to, and, and might cover it. Like, that well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have no idea what was heard on the intro, but um, basically, long story short, I've been real excited to have today's guest on ever since we started this podcast, and. Um, I realized, and Tyler could tell you, I realized this like right before we were going to start recording. I met our guest 20 years ago. Um, so I just felt my hair get grayer yeah, as yeah. we sat down to do this. But um, Grant Hickman from Canyon, Texas, uh, represent. Uh, I met Grant when I was a freshman in high school. He was a senior. Yes. Uh, his girlfriend at the time, her locker was next to mine. So we're talking like first day of school of high school. I met this guy like it, <laughs> something like that. So it, and we were in the same youth group. Um, and if that confuses anybody from Canyon, yeah, I know I went to the Methodist church, but uh, I kind of like double dipped. I went to both churches and then I got Dude, busted across the gr- street. It is, you know, one of them got to lunch quicker. You kind of gauged it on that and uh i got away with it until they published the like congratulations graduating seniors article and i was in both pictures uh so yes <laughs> uh but it's it's so cool because uh i met grant he was a member of a group called the purple posse which i was later kind of a part of and then we end up going to umhb and yeah we man both, founding we, member right here that's right yeah <laughs> I was kind of like a. Was uh, that a la- canyon or was that at UHP? That was canyon. It was like on a, a canyon. Okay. It was basically our couch crew, and um, yeah. I was like one of the last people when it was on its way out, and then it kind of resurfaced, um, and it's still going. It's like a you started something that is like still up and running at that school, dude. Uh, that's what's that's what's nuts is like I have I have cousins that graduated from Canyon High in the last couple like last five six years, and they're like a part of it, and I was like, oh, that's fun. <laughs> like that's. There's not a lot of stuff you do that like ever lasts and you're right. They revived it. It's pretty, yeah. pretty cool. 
especially like at the high school level for something to last that long and it was just like and we just ridiculous stuff like skits at pep rallies and stuff but um yeah it it was cool because like you did stuff like that and the same kind of stuff like you were involved with in college you were also kind of that way in high school and um i'm giving kind of like the rundown here but grant had he came from a large family lots of siblings all super nice people and through like the best fireworks show uh, of anybody in Canyon <laughs> at their property. And it was like a few years ago, I was back in town for the fourth and uh, we went over to Crestview Elementary. Um, I'm not going to say represent, screw that place. Uh, so we were in the parking lot and we're watching these fireworks shoot up from a neighborhood. And Hannah was like, wait, what's that? And I was like, that's the Hickmans. So uh, that's me. Yep. But uh, yeah, and so it was, it was kind of interesting that before I had fully decided to go to UMHB, uh, you had just transferred down there and were the mascot, but I'm going to let, I'm going to hand off to you, kind of take us through, because you started WT, like tell us how you ended up at UMHB. Right. Yeah, dude, Garrett, thanks for that intro. Like that, uh, like genuinely, that means a lot to me. I think it's, it's cool to, that you and I can go all the way back to my roots in Canyon um, it was there. And then that's where like, you know, the purple posse at Canyon high, by the time I got to Mary Harden Baylor and they had the couch crew, I was like, Oh, I, this is literally <laughs> me. Like I, Hey guys. Um, I don't, I don't know if you know this about me, but I, yes. Um, so yeah, I went to WT West Texas A&M, uh, there in Canyon, Texas D2 school, my freshman year. The short story on that is my dad, uh, who is actually now, he's gone back to school at Texas Tech, which is cool. He's finishing his degree now. Um, but he was at Texas Tech for six years and never graduated. Wow. wow and so I didn't know that. There's a whole cool story there. Yeah, yeah. So there's a whole story there on on why he didn't and and God stuff. But uh, his deal was, for, for my brother and I, was freshman year, stay local, um, where he can kind of be like, can my son's transition into college healthy? Uh, and, and in a way that he didn't, and he was helping put us through school. And then he said, but I, you got to understand, uh, this is Garrett will understand this, um, with no hubris or ego in this in the small town of Canyon. My dad is like a, he's well-known he's a, he's yeah. a minor celebrity. In a I'm going to, I'm going to clarify uh, anyone so, who's driven through Austin recently and sees this giant new building in Austin of all places says happy state bank on the side. Um, it was not always a giant thing. And that started very small right. back in the bandito with Grant's dad. So wow. yeah. Awesome. Yes. Talk about yes. starting yes. legacies so, that last a long time. Yeah. Absolutely. I, my favorite story to tell is I remember driving on Sansi from, Am- from Canyon to Amarillo one time and I got pulled over by a state trooper <laughs> and uh, the state, cause I was speeding. Um, and the state trooper looked at my, my driver's license and he goes, Oh, you must be J Pat's boy. And I was like, <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am. Is that a good or a bad thing? And he goes, <laughs> so where are you headed? And I was like, I'm a teller at Happy State Bank and I'm late. <laughs> and he was like, gotcha. You should be on time. Get out of here. Go. <laughs> so uh, I was like, all right. All right. So, so with college, my dad was like, stay close for a year and like, like live at home, get all the home cooked meals, mom will do laundry and you have all the freedom of college, which that's fantastic. Um, but he then basically bribed us to leave our second year to go make a name for ourselves and, yeah. and to go like, okay, now that you've transitioned into the college and you understand that go, go be a name for yourself. So um, again, guys, I, a short story on that is I was praying about where to go. I applied at Texas tech. Um, Cause I, my entire life had been born and raised to be a red Raider uh, went to with West Texas A&M went to beach reach South Padre Island. And if they, they pair you up with other schools that you're on the same shifts. And we were paired up with a school called Mary Harden Baylor. Uh, and because uh, m- one of my best friends who Garrett knows, Brad Massey, um, who grew up in Canyon with us, we were like, hey, this week, like West freshman year at WT feels like you're thir- feels like grade 13. Uh, we just hung out with the, the Mary Harden Baylor crew the whole time and loved it. And so I called um, a friend at Texas Tech. And I was like, I know myself well enough to know that if I go to tech and I live on campus, I'm going to fall into the trappings of all of the party life at Texas Tech. I just, I just know my own personality and my, my wanting to be a part of the crowd. So find me a place to live off campus. I called somebody at Mary Harden Baylor and I, who had met at Beach Reach. And I said, hey, um, at that time, UMHB still had a curfew. 
Uh, and I was like, I know myself well enough to know that if I live on campus in the dorms and I've had complete freedom at home and now I'm going to go to college as a sophomore and I'm going to have more regulations at college than I have at home, I will rebel against that entire system and get written up all of the time. Um, so find me a place to live off campus, which is funny that like both places I needed to live off campus and for very different reasons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I literally, my prayer at that point said, I said, God, the first place you give me a place to live off campus, that's where I'm going to go. Wow. Uh, two weeks later, two, literally two weeks later, 14 days, a guy uh, that I had barely met from UMHB called me and said, hey, I hear you're looking for a place to stay off campus. Uh, we're looking for somebody else. Would you come and stay with us? And I said, absolutely. And I hung up the phone and said, I'm going to Mary Harden Baylor. Wow. So that, like, that's how I did it. Meanwhile, back in Canyon, Texas, I was about to watch the Stag Bowl, and uh, I was talking to uh, Greg Franklin and yes. Hunter Lee about it. And Hunter tells me he's like, "Dude, Grant's the mascot now." I'm like, "Get out of here! Is he really?" So, how how uh, you you get down there when originally it wasn't even on your radar, and then like a year later, you are the mascot. And when I say mascot, people, we're Whoa. not talking about the Burger King that they have now. No, we're no, talking no, no, the no. <laughs> like, yeah. like head that i'm looking out the nostrils of yeah. i mean it, and that's not an exaggeration um and dude garrett it wasn't even a year so like i get on campus i jump into the couch crew uh it's football season 2004 uh we're having a blast and within like one or two games um henry morin and jr smith are are both a part of the couch crew at that point and they're upperclassmen and i'm like Oh, face painting and decking out and wearing capes. Jer Garrett, you'll appreciate this. My like purple thing that I wore at the games was a um, Canyon Eagle track suit that yes. I'd stolen when I was there at, at Kane High School. I think I think the statute of limitations is up, so I can say that. Um, and so like, I've got a picture and they were like, bro, you, whatever, we get it. Somewhere in that, I think it was JR, was like, hey, you know, like nobody's the mascot right now at Mary Harden Baylor. Like we live like, nobody wanted to be the mascot because <laughs> the thing was ugly it scared children yeah. i wish i was making that up it didn't scare like i'm not it totally scared children i had to uh, wear it one and time like, and you're right <laughs> yeah scared yeah. me and so i was like i was like cool i was like so what's that mean he's like dude if if you want to be the mascot like you're gonna get a cheerleading scholarship not that division three can give out athletic scholarships no. <laughs> but it was an academic scholarship that you had to be a cheerleader to get yeah. Uh, and, and I was like, fantastic. Great. Right. By the way, um, I think it was $250 a semester. It was, <laughs> which is kind of, which is just kind of laughable. I thought um, it was 500 per so semester. And then I said, that'll probably the pay the parking fines you get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so I was like, okay, what do I got to do? And they were like, here's the costume, yada, yada, yada. It was like so low regulation of any kind. And my deal, I, I was like, hey, I, I, I just, that was back when we were meeting at Tiger Stadium there in Belton. Yeah. Big red um, enough so, so right, right. The huge stadium we have that's awesome. Thank you, McLean, uh, was not built. And the cheerleaders were over in front of the stands and the students were in the end zone stands. And that's where the couch crew was. And I loved being down there and banging on barrels. And I was like, I'll be the mascot. As long as I like don't have to hang out with the cheerleaders, I can hang out with the students. <laughs> and the, the school was like, we just need somebody put, to put on this costume and show up to the games. I was like, done. So that's what I did. I'm like literally in the giant head looking through the nostrils, banging on trash cans uh, and had had nothing to do with with. And I was like, you're going to pay me 250 bucks to show up to a football game and do what I would do anyway. <laughs> Deal. Did you, uh, did they take uh, you to so, the road games or just the home games? No, like literally like they didn't even invite me like to on the road <laughs> games or the bus. Now what's hilarious is I went like me and Ryan Eastman, my roommates and all like we loaded up and we drove to the games with the mascot in the back of the car. Um, and I'd show up and put it on and go do my thing. <laughs> and amazing guys, I mean, the thing, we were sophomores in college and the things that we like that, that, that mascot head saw and the goofy <laughs> things we did with it was just hilarious. Cause I just took it home. I literally just took it home every game. It was, it's, it was fantastic. And so that's, I was the mascot for a little bit. 
the the part that I shouldn't probably admit is <laughs> after the football season. I didn't go to basketball games. I didn't go to, like, go to volleyball games. Like, I took the scholarship for football season, and I, that was it. That was it. Like, that's all I did. Was uh, was Farah still the cheer? Was she the cheer coach already when you were? Uh, when she you were was there. Yeah. yeah I she, think okay. So. That's yep. amazing. That's hilarious. And, you know, knowing how so, sc- knowing how scary that that old costume was. Now picturing you with a bat, like I that will <laughs> that will keep me up at night. <laughs> Dude, it's the so true. It's old so true. costume was so like awkward. So we they did like the cheer camp at SMU when I did it, and I couldn't really move around. And they're like, "You are a terrible dancer." I'm like, "Okay, a it's the suit. B I mean, yeah, I am a terrible dancer, but at this particular case, it's the suit's fault." I, I finally got fed up. I ran and did a front flip in the air and we were doing a skit about hospital for mascots or whatever. So I had to jump over the Prairie View Panthers and I just like landed on my back and the whole auditorium of cheer squad just like, is he okay? Was that on purpose? Like <laughs> it sucked like that thing. And it didn't smell great because who knows how many people had worn it. But uh, they told yes. me that the next week they're like, hey, a new suit just came in. And I was like, oh, hallelujah. So I the, the one they currently yeah. have, I got to be like, the first person to wear it, no bo in that thing. It was nice. great. Yeah. So yeah, Grant, it was you, uh, that was. Yeah, Tyler. Did you just do? Uh, were you just the mascot that one year, or did you keep? Yeah, on doing it? It was, yeah, it was yeah. Tommy I Wilson did it after just him. that year. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like I literally did it that year, and then Tommy Wilson showed up, and I was like, "Hey, man, you want to get a scholarship?" <laughs> <laughs> right? And it was like. I suckered somebody else into that thing. I feel um, like that's almost how every like for a while it. that's how everyone ended up mascot. Because for me, like it was, uh, I got I kind of got pressured into it by two. But so first, Tatendo was like, uh, he was talking to Tommy Wilson in the quad, and Tommy's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go to Hong Kong next year." And uh, somebody else was standing. There. I don't remember who it was. They're like, well, "Who's gonna be mascot?" I just walked up. He turned and goes, "Garrett Smith's gonna do." It. I'm like, "No, I'm not." <laughs> And uh, and he's like, yeah, you're. I was like, dude, I am too busy next year. I don't have time. Well, Tatenda, who was involved with literally everything in the planet, was like, don't right. talk to me about no time. Here's what I do. And he just like tears into me. I'm like, okay, I'll think about it. And uh, Landon Taylor was going to go out for cheerleader. And I laughed. And I was like, all right, dude, if you actually do this and you make it, I'll go tell him I want to be the mascot. Well, he freaking made it. And I'm a man <laughs> of my words. So there we were. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Well, well, I told that, uh, shout out to Brett Land uh, from Canyon. When he yes. decided he was going to go to UMHB, I told him, I said, look, we have this pattern, all right? Every other mascot's a dude from Canyon. No pressure, but you got to do it. He, he didn't do it. <laughs> and he'd no, have no, actually no. made a good mascot. Well, but, oh, he'd have been great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he'd been fantastic, yeah. Which and, and that's what's fun is like, I said yes to the, you know, here I am, cool God story of coming to Mary Harden Baylor. I'm there. I'm like, sure, I'll be the mascot. You're going to give me a scholarship to do what I would do anyway. Sounds good to me. Well, 2004, we went to the national championship football game mm-hmm. um, and we ended up losing, but, but by seven points and we missed a couple of field goals and a the touchdown punt catch uh-huh. in the end zone that, right. It, yeah. It was a whole thing. We should have won, but like the, again, the cheerleading team like loaded up on a bus and they all went early and then they organized like a student bus charter buses for us to go. And here I am as the mascot on the student charter bus with the mascot uniform <laughs> under the bus. And I, I, I ride all the way um, there. One of my good friends, Haley, is, is her and I were, were, were seatmates the whole trip there. And I get there and I put on the mascot uniform and I walk onto the field and they're like, oh, it's the mascot. He's here. Like, I have no <laughs> like credentials or whatever. I and. So like my like my goofy like claim to fame and when anytime you play two truths and a lie, one of my truths is I was a collegiate mascot at a national championship football game. That's a good one. I love it. No, nope, no, nope, right? Like nobody knew it was me, but my mom. Um, <laughs> like because the head was so ugly. Like I, but I would guys. I was on ESPN too. Like it's I, true. I have been on ESPN too. You know, and it was like it's it's goofy, it's fun, but I'm also like, what a fun memory. Oh yeah. Like what a cool, cool, fun memory that I got to have that I wouldn't have had. Like I just, yeah. because I said yes to some opportunities. It's so funny back in Canyon, we were like the, uh, the meme of when he's pointing at the TV, like, Hey, I, I see that, you know, like, uh, cause you know, we knew you were in the suit. And so there was a clip where you were like jumping up and down on the sideline. And I, we were like, there he is. We see him, but take us yeah. to, so oh, you- and I had, I had no routines. 
Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounded funny. Like after that, every guy kind of had his own like thing he did. Like Tommy had this hilarious, like goofy dance he did and it just cracked everybody up. And then for me, I was not a great dancer, but I, I was known really for taunting the parents of the other team's players. <laughs> and that was kind of my thing. And, uh, before I jump to the next thing, I have to say, uh, you had told me about the incidents that went on at Harden Simmons when they put their couch crew and our couch crew together one time where they were like spitting oh, yeah. the beer on y'all and people were going to jail and stuff. And that story always stuck with me because two years later, when I was the mascot, we went back there and it was everything you described and more. I mean, it was, I, I did the taunting thing and they started to run around the track to attack us and Weston Savelle and Jeremy Williams and like the cops had to kind of like intervene, but uh it it was it was yep. for real back then it, it's not as heated at least on our side but us us old folks know <laughs> when you go to abilene which by the way <laughs> well, I back drove... then it was still competitive yeah yeah no kidding yeah they just make it look like it's going to be competitive now and then they don't um it, it was kind of funny last weekend you mentioned tech earlier uh, nathan berryman and i had to drive through abilene the night before that game and uh we're like mocking cars as we drive by we went to Lubbock. It's my first time back to Lubbock in like six years. And we were there when they beat Texas the other day. And it was glorious. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, huge. And what's so funny, you know, I'm an Aggie and we're taking pictures by the statue. I got my Aggie ring and somebody else was like, hey, that's not a tech ring. I said, no, you caught me. It was two other Aggies wearing tech shirts with me. It was like all these Aggies were meeting up wearing tech stuff to root for tech. But we uh, that's fun. It was really fun on the way home though, because UMHB had already won. So we got to eat lunch in Abilene and we we're like, oh yeah, let's get our let's get our UMHB shirts out of the suitcase and like <laughs> flaunt them at the wing stop. Nice. Uh but yeah, yep. so you were you were mascot for a year and then you ended up uh you were a couch crew captain by the time I got to school. So how how did that go? Because the the process and the a lot of things about that were so different back then. Oh gosh, yeah. Like it, it was very uh, loose back then. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I remember, I remember guys like, uh, we were not even my sophomore year when I transferred in, we weren't even an official school organization yet. It, that, it, that was the was best so, part. Was just guys, right. It was just guys being on a trash cans. And, and actually I was one of the few, um, at the time that here I am brand new mascot, but the, with, with Henry and JR and those guys, they were like, Hey, you know, talk to, we're about to get a we're official, we're going to be a school organization. But because of my experience with the purple posse at Canyon high school, we had all this freedom in the world. And the mm -hmm. moment you become a school organization, administration is like, Oh no, you're receiving money. Now here's the rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of the few guys on the team. They're going, Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I've lived this in high school. Yeah. I don't know that we want to do that. Like you lose some freedom um, when you yeah. take like money from the school. In that um, way, I followed now, you in the worst of ways because I was in the purple posse <laughs> when it became a thing and we got in so much trouble yep. for nothing, really. Then I, I was a couch crew captain th two years after you graduated. And man, you talk about regulations. It was bad. Yeah. And we you you just have to get smart. Um, yeah. You just have to get smart about how you um, be honoring and and follow the administration because because we want to honor the, the people that are in charge. and push the envelope and have fun in a way that is good, clean fun, which is, I yeah. think that's what always the couch crew is supposed to be is it's like, we're yeah. rowdy fans that love our school. We're not actually trying to cause any trouble. No. Um, and yet in that we push. So it, it was so unregulated that I, it was basically like, Hey, you're on the couch crew. Oh, you have leadership ability. Welcome to being a couch crew. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it was just, it was that simple for me. There I, that, you know, there was, I think I remember having a conversation or two about the process and, and what that looked like, but it really, um, it just, it was not a thing. It just kind of was like, yeah, we needed a certain number of our captains and, and grants here. So that's, and I, and I loved it. And I, I have no um, bad memories of being on the couch crew and uh, anything. And I, I, even as we became an official organization, um, the administration at the time was great about working with us and having those conversations and going, Hey, I know that we can't X. So let's figure out a way around that. Um, and yeah. that was about the time that like during playoff games, they were like, mm -hmm. Hey, we can't have our trash cans and metal drums at playoff games because of, of neutral site for playoff game kind of stuff a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we were like, okay, can we, and we just, we just got creative about what to do differently. Um, and I think that's some of the things that 
if you weren't there for some of that process that you missed out on was like, hey, you can view administration as against you or you understand they've got a job that they have to do and they're trying to hold the line on things and they actually want to work with you Mm -hmm. on it. And so if you'll slow down enough to have an adult conversation, you can figure it out. Yeah. It stayed that way too. For about a year after you left, the group that came in after y'all, it it was that same kind of thing. Like if you work with them, then when my group finally got our time, it was like, they kind of slammed the book down and said, okay, no more of that. We're, we're going to, we're going to regular. I was like, man, this is what I signed up for. Well, I was just thinking about my time. Cause I saw the end. I went down with the ship. I played as the, the violin as, as, as the, the whole thing sunk. And uh, you were talking about the money. I'm like, well, shoot, I don't remember them giving us any money, but we definitely still had a whole lot of rules. Yeah. We, uh, we got, we got the credit card one time and it was, I think it was by that time we'd bothered them so badly. They're like, you know, we're just going to throw some money at y'all if you'll just leave us alone. So <laughs> when we went to Iowa, which we, we paid for the trip really in our own pocket, but they handed us the credit card and said, all right, we haven't really let y'all use it this year. Here's all your meals. Have fun. I was like, all right. Nice. Yeah, it was fantastic. Y'all, and y'all did a great job with it because I remember uh, Jeff Sutton, you, and I forgot the girl's name uh, yep. who was always on the front. What was her name? Uh, red hair, I think. I don't remember. Oh, that would have been Ashley. Okay, Ashley. Yeah, there was, I remember there were three of you on the front and then you had like, Jay Train and Owen Dasky had that obnoxious uh, horn before Andy Archibald was yep. a student. So there was like a different train horn type thing. And then you had like Rusty with all the barrel. I mean, everyone had their thing. That the for it not being yeah. a like regulator or like hierarchy thing, there was a good system in place. And I think back on some of like the Mississippi College dad that flipped us the bird and just all that stuff, which we really didn't. We didn't do anything that bad. It was just people couldn't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you. Uh, so, what are some other things you were involved with? Because uh, I, I I told everyone oh how gosh. I met you in high school, but it was kind of like. The way I met you in college yeah. was interesting. I came in as a freshman when you were a senior and you were my welcome week leader. And so people talk about yep. Tatenda Tavaziva as the one guy that knew every soul on campus. But before that, Grant knew everyone. And I learned <laughs> I learned quickly, like Grant was almost like, you have your Facebook set up? I'm like, yeah, which is funny because now it's like hardly any of us use it. Yeah. But uh, I was like, I just set up my Facebook. And by the end of the next week, just by like being in Grant's welcome week group, my Facebook friend list was just like probably still at half the people who are on it now are from that first two weeks of college. Oh man. No, that's true. That's true. Well, like Facebook came in, it was brand new when we were Mm -hmm. in college. So, um, you know, that it was, it was like, and and like some of the larger universities, Baylor and Texas had gotten it. And then we got it later. So it was like, yes, all of my other college friends at larger schools already had it. Um, But man, I, I, I look back on my time at UMHB and I, I loved every moment of it. So you know, I tried to be involved on campus and I was just heavily, I loved it. I think some of my favorite um, memories were um, a gal named Kristen and I ended up getting to basically be the MCs for, I think, every single event on campus. That if it was there in the chapel and they were hosting an event, there was like a, a two and a year and a half, two year gap where Kristen and I were going to, like, we were the MCs and that's what we did. <laughs> Um, and whether it was, uh, you know, I was a part of the, the crusaders, uh, oh gosh, I just totally blanked out on the name, the guys one, not the, Crew the, nights, the male yeah. beauty pageant. Crew Crusader nights. Thank nights, you. Yeah. Um, uh, I was a part, I was in it. I was a part of it, but I also got to MC it. Um, you know, miss, uh, UMHB. I was a part of that one, um, getting to do it. Um, in fact, there was a moment where I was in seeing that dating somebody that was in it. She got third place that year, which was fantastic. Um, I had nothing to do with it. There was no back channel payments. I promise. <laughs> um, just for the record, uh, she got that on her own. Um, and yet my, you know, like my wife now, Jenna, who was a golfer at UMHB, um, was there in the audience there. And so like she and, and I were friends and, um, I was, I just, everything from the emceeing every single event on campus to being a part of the crew to be, I was in, I was involved at BSM. I was an intern. Um, it, for Andy Davis at FBC, uh, while I was there, I just I just jumped in and said, "I'm going to just embrace this. I'm going to be a part of everything that I can be a part of here." Um, and I loved every single bit of it. It was just super fun to be there. That that uh, one of the things I used to say about Mary Harden Baylor all the time was, uh, it was small enough that no matter what event you went to, you would know somebody there, mm-hmm. and big enough that you could always meet new people. Yeah, and I loved that 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 idea. Um, 
even to at the time, and guys, this may not have been around by the time you guys got there, but we would always go to Granger, Texas, yeah, and go to the Cotton Club. Cotton Club, yeah. And <laughs> um, that's like, here's what's great. Like, I met my wife at the Cotton Club when she came in during oh. that freshman week. Is it? And there's a whole fun story there. Um, my so I have six kids now, um, ten to two. Uh, my second born is a son. Um, and as well as my sixth kid. And so four girls, two boys, my son is, his name is Granger. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Uh, because we named, and we named him after Granger, Texas, the, the yeah. city that my wife and I met in. And it was just this, like, he's got my initials, JGH. Um, he's, his first name is James after both of his grandpas, but like that, like every, I loved all of my stuff there that when we were looking for a good G name for my son, I'm like, we met in Granger. I know it means farmer and that's kind of lame, but like, that's where we met. <laughs> that's um, so cool. So that's, and so your, your think, next one will be Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, uh, we're done. We are done, man. Six kids is enough. <laughs> I'm, I have a, uh, I, I'm on my first right now and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get some sleep finally. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to me. I think last time, like, your, your first son was a baby last time I saw you. I think we were at the Canyon 4th of yeah. July. We both happened to be back in town. And I'm like, that doesn't seem like right. long ago to me. But then you mentioned their ages. I'm like, wow, that it was that long. Wow. Yep. That's insane. Yep. He's nine. So that kind of is a perfect segue into what have you been up to since UMHB? And if, if our little timer at the top runs yeah. out, we can just log right back in with the same info because I'm cheap and don't pay for <laughs> Zoom. Uh, this Dude, podcast is open me. for sponsors. For <laughs> uh yes. yeah um oh dude so uh, you can take this in a couple of categories right so like um educational wise so since we started at mayor and baylor um finished my undergrad there in business management immediately went in to uh four years for 120 hours for a, a master's of theology there at dallas theological seminary finished that up in four and a half years jumped into the pastorate have, have been a part of that and loved it um, I'm currently, I should have been done like two years ago, but it is what it is. Um, writing a thesis to finish my doctorate at Denver Seminary. Denver and Seminary. So, um, That's where yeah. I'm at right now. Oh, dude. Fantastic, yeah, dude. I love, I love that, Tyler. Yeah, I, <laughs> dude, I'm going to be there, uh, I think in February. They're hosting a class that I'm going to come sit in on. Um, I'd love to connect with you while I'm in town. Um, and so I, I love Denver Seminary. It was great. So I'm trying to finish a doctorate there. Uh, and I say that I'm, there's a whole long story there we don't have time for. Yeah. Um, so education, man, I just have continued like to do that. And here I am, um, it, you know, purple and gold and getting old. I'm 38 next <laughs> month and hoping to finish the, the this this doctorate. Uh, Family-wise, I, as I already mentioned, we've got... Um, Six fantastic kids, Jara, Granger, Penny, uh, Essie, Lena, and Kai. Uh, so six kids, 10 to two years old, that they are my world and my life, and I love it. Um, my wife, Jenna, played golf at Mary Harden Baylor, finished accounting. She's a full-time mom, homeschooling, and just rocking it and, and loving it. And so my family life, I couldn't, like, we never planned to have six kids. We just, we do. Yeah. Um, and I'll, if you want to know the stories and why, man, that that's our thing. <laughs> I current for the past six years, I'm just kind of fast forward a little bit. Um, I have been serving, uh, at a church up in the greater Portland, Oregon area. Uh, and there's a whole super fun God story of how I got up here. Um, and I'm doing that, but I am currently, we have three campuses, uh, that are up here. One in the city of Westland, one in the city of Beaverton and one in the city of Milwaukee, uh, all three of them have three different church names, which we've done strategically because they were adoptions and mergers. And there was already a, a good, like the name of the church was already regionally secure. And so we just said, let's keep that for now. There's no reason to change that. We want to do great kingdom work together. And so I serve on our executive team uh, as our executive pastor of coaching and development. And so what that means is I preach uh, pretty regularly at all three of our campuses on, on Sunday, the bet and, and and love getting to do that. But I I develop our staff, and so part of my job is to make sure that we're our staff is healthy, and and just staying emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, um, and, and and healthy, and that they've got a good pace. 
And, but the, the other fun part is I get to coach other churches. And so regionally, a little bit of Oregon, Pacific Northwest, but even beyond, I've got churches in Arizona and in Las Vegas. I was on a call today with a guy for about 45 minutes in Las Vegas that just, I don't want you to be our church. I want you to be the healthiest version of, of you and have the best kingdom impact there. And so um, just a cool thing. I never thought that a dude from Canyon, Texas would end up in Portland, Oregon. I mean, you want to talk about some differences, but yeah. Yeah. Um, man, God, God's just been super faithful. Uh, we joke, um, those of you may be listening to this that know my wife, she went to Mary Harden Baylor, but she's from Maui, Hawaii. So our running joke is we just split the difference between our families. My family's in Texas, hers is in Maui, Portland. Uh, um, so yeah, like that is the like, cliff notes version of of what i've been up to and what i'm getting to do now and um i just i love it mary harden baylor in a lot of ways what's fun about this dude is i i hope you can um edit well because of covid we've been filming all our sermons for the past two years so i'm really oh, good wow. at being told in the middle of talking to go stop back up <laughs> restart um <laughs> oh so, so, so do you, y'all do uh, kind of pre-recorded stuff then we do so so we're back oregon is behind okay. so right like texas is like a year ahead of us yeah, we, yeah. we opened up about a year after mm-hmm. um and so currently like i'm preaching this weekend at our campus at one of our campuses um and i will record that message thursday see that makes me so jealous um. because <laughs> when we were when we were doing online services I, we were having, we were showing up on Sunday morning and like just streaming it live. And then I, I started talking to some other ministry friends. They're like, yeah, man, we do it like Thursday night. And I'm like, wait, so you don't have to get up on a Sunday morning? Like, no, it's been amazing. <laughs> oh, I hate No, that. dude. <laughs> For two years, I, I stayed at home and worked church with my family. It was great. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, that's yeah. so cool. Oh, and so, so, it's been, but what I, what I was saying right there, there before it cut off was like my time at Mary Harden Baylor, I specifically studied business uh, because I knew that God had called me towards ministry. I didn't know what that meant. Um, even, and and I, I would even say back then, people were like, you're going to go be a pastor. And I was like, I do not have the grace or the patience to be a pastor. Like, if you think the music is too loud and you don't like the font, I don't really care. <laughs> um, guys, pastors shouldn't say that. Like, like, that's, like you're not supposed to. But God has just consistently grown me. By the way, I have more patience and grace for people because God's taught me more about his grace in, in my time. Um, another time I'll tell you about some of the hardest stuff that I went through in my life that taught me grace. And it's fun now to get to coach other churches. And what a lot of that I lean on is, yeah, I can do the theology thing with you and we can, we can get in that. But because I serve people that theologically are across a huge span of things, a lot of what it is, is best practices. Gotcha. And a lot of it is just sitting down and going, let me teach you about leadership development. Let me teach you about leading a team. Let me teach you. And, and not that I'm the expert. I, I want to be really clear on this. I, I'm asking a lot of questions to, to be the best for them. But it's, it's interesting how a lot of what I end up doing with them, I go back and I'm like, I don't know that I've learned this in my master's. Some of it I've learned in my doctorate this is the business degree that I got in my undergrad coming into play. Uh, and that's just, that's just the cool thing that, that God does um, at the time. And so I love um, that now and, and uh, forgive me for the like goofy theological language on this. Um, I kind of feel like I get to be an apostle in the like little a apostle to the Portland region of this guy that loves Jesus wants to build his kingdom And in the same way that Paul was writing to churches of a region, um, like the book of Ephesus, I get to help churches in the region of the Pacific Northwest be the best version of themselves. And I, I learned, I learned that leadership stuff during my undergrad. That's incredible. So so would you say you took, oh, go for it. Oh, I was, I was going to say, what's it like serving in a ministry in an area like Portland, um, you know, which is not the Bible Belt whatsoever. It's like, not Canyon, Texas. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so what's it like serving there? And what have you found has led to success being in an environment that is not as culturally Christian at all as compared to where you yeah. grew up? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things in, in that question. Um, one is it like 
cultural Christianity is not a thing here. And yet spiritual appetite and openness is. Mm, so yeah. spirituality is very much a thing. And, and part of that culture is like, man, you, you do you and whatever you, and so it's kind of this like, well, this is me. And so you, if, if you want me to accept you unconditionally, mm. I'm going to ask you to accept me unconditionally. And if we can both do that, then great. Right. Yeah. Um, as far as relationship. And so one of the things we, we talk about a lot here um, is we kind of draw this triangle and we say a lot of the way that maybe other church culture and, and even, let, let's take it out of church culture. The world talks about relationships is if, if it's a triangle, the like foundation of that is um, this agreement thing that like, I have to agree with you. Then the, the middle rung of the triangle is understanding. And then the top is acceptance. So we agree, we learn to understand and now accept you. And we go, no, the gospel flips that on its head. The gospel of Jesus says, I accept you because God has accepted me right where I am. Yeah. I accept you where you are. Now let's in relationship grow an understanding of each other. And then that will lead to further agreement on things. But agreement is not the base. Acceptance is the base. And when you lay that out with somebody up here, they're like, oh, that makes a whole lot of sense. That's actually what I want from you. <laughs> um, and so you're, you're doing that. And, and then the other nuance of that is coming from Texas. I was serving in a, at a fantastic church in Amarillo before I came up here is as a pastor, people, you know, you're going to talk to people about identity. You're going to talk to them about strongholds and, and what are they holding on to that they need to repent of, uh, which identity plays in that. You're going to talk to them about you know, their pocketbook, um, the rhythms of our faith, of prayer and worship and devotion. Well, in the Bible Belt, you approach that from religious language. Mm, yeah. Because uh, people have a context to understand that religious language. But if I'm going to talk to you about identity, I'm going to talk to you about your job. I'm going to talk to you about your family of origin. I'm going to talk. Well, guess what? The same thing happens up here. It's still identity. I'm just approaching it from a different angle. I'm not mm -hmm. going to come in with talking about it, you know, around Christianese. I'm going to go like, so, hey, tell me growing up, where did you find your identity? Or tell me about your family. Once I figure that out, at the core of it, it's the exact same conversation. It's just masked differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what I kind of learned as a pastor up here. Now, there's all sorts of cultural nuance things yeah. that happen um, that I've had to learn. And, and, and had to grow in. And I think that's part of being what, what Paul meant with all things to all people. But mm -hmm. I, man, we thoroughly enjoy living up here. Um, awesome. I never thought there'd be a place that, that I, I enjoyed as much as I do living up here. Um, we're an hour and a half to Mount Hood where we can play in the snow and sled. And we're an hour and a half to the coast uh, <laughs> where we can be on the beach. And so that's, and you, you guys both know being in Texas, everybody's up here like, you wait, you drove an hour and a half? to then like hang out for three hours and drive home. And we're like, yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, tell, like, we, uh, so. we grew up in a hometown that you're like, you can go three or four hours anywhere and still not really be. <laughs> I, had an, I had an interim pastor one time from Hawaii and he calls me up one, one Saturday to just ask him stuff. And he goes, what's all that noise in the background? I said, I'm at the beach. And he goes, you're at the beach. I'm like, yeah. He's, How far is it? I'm like, two two and a half hours i can't believe you drove that far to a beach i was like stan <laughs> not all of us live somewhere we can walk across the street and i'm also at port yep. if you saw this water you'd have a heart attack <laughs> that's, a, yep. that's why the, the beauty of that beach is if you're used to galveston suddenly you feel like you're in yeah. hawaii if you go to port a yeah, yeah, yeah. uh so <laughs> it, it's interesting you know you mentioned hawaii earlier and how far people because so like when we were in school i felt like it was like lords of the sith you know when it came to canyon there were always two no more no less you know like you were there, I was there, and then you left, and then like uh, Sasha Monreal played for the basketball team, so there were two Canyonites, and then I think I don't know if Tracy. she stayed the next year. Uh, tra yeah, Tracy and Brett came in, so there were three of us that last year, uh, but it wasn't many. And then uh, after I left, Eddie Kaler came in. Tyler, is he our next guest? He's our yeah, he's our next guest. Uh, so we got two Canyon, <laughs> we got two Canyon interviews back to yes. back. That's awesome. Uh, so it, it was kind of interesting, but like uh, you talking about Hawaii, I know uh, your wife is friends with uh, Lindsay Austin and. It was funny, after yep. ye, after yep. years of being away from Temple, my wife and I, you know, we moved back to Temple and uh, she and her husband lived down the street from us, you know, for a couple of years. Yeah, they're, they're two of our best world. friends. Great folks. Great folks. Yep. yep. So Lindsay, Lindsay and my wife, Jenna, 
uh, were best friends growing up um, in high school. And then Lindsay came out and played soccer there. And um, her husband, Jude, played soccer there as well. And they're, um, they're, they're two of our like best friends. I, 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 let's put it this way. If we ever left here to move back to Mary Harden Baylor, it'd be to be close to them. Love yeah, they're, I, I like them a lot. Um, there's, uh, so one thing, and it's kind of like, I don't have many like UMHB related questions, but it kind of ties into your careers. Me personally, I remember having a conversation with Jeff Payne one time where he said, you know, he's like, I love everything I'm learning in the Christian studies department, but I wish I had more classes across the parking lot where more business was tied into it. And I think of, you know, my sister, she studied business at Baylor before she went to seminary at Asbury. And yeah. then I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I, I appreciate all the learning I had at school, but looking at my career ever since leaving college, I think I have 98% of it probably came from outside of the classroom. Uh, what would you say like your leadership roles and just experiences that you had outside of the classroom have helped you out? Yeah, so um, as in like, like define for me a little bit more what you mean by leadership roles. Oh, uh, like for me, I was in student government, couch crew, all that stuff. And I've been able to like take instances from those things and apply them to like the business world and that kind of stuff later on. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. To that degree. Um, that's where you're learning to deal with people, mm -hmm. right? In a classroom, you're not learning to deal with people. Um, and we all know, I don't care what you go into, people are involved with it. And so if you can be involved in those extracurricular things when you're in college, uh, you're, you, you've got to sit on a team of individuals, even if it's as simple um, as stunt night and, and just diving into that, you're like, well, I, I was a director for stunt night. So we had to figure out like, how do you get a team of people to write a script to move forward and to galvanize it. And our class was really good. We won every single year. Um, and so like, like how, how do you lead that? You learn, you learn that. And gosh, you learn some of it the really hard way. Yeah. <laughs> by what you, right. Because we all know um, failure is a great teacher. And so sometimes when you do it poorly, you look back and go, well, now at least I don't know what to do, but I know what not to do. Yeah. Um, and then you had, I mean, at the time, Sean Shannon was there and Dr. L was there. And I mean, I remember guys, I, I had a pretty crazy, um, probably the first massive, uh, spiritual warfare experience while I was at Mary Harden Baylor. And I didn't know how to process that. So I called Sean Shannon with my friend, Kristen, and the two of us <clears throat> sat down with Sean and the way she responded to that. Well, she said, Hey, I want to hear your story. And then I'm not going to respond right away. I'm going to, I'm going to be rethinking what you told me. And I want to make sure that I respond appropriately. So don't take my silence as not being engaged or caring. Nobody teaches you that mm -hmm. in a, in, in a classroom that was sitting on a curb outside Mary Harden Baylor after a walk with Sean Shannon, where I learned that. And now is, so now I'm a, I'm a coach for churches. I'm super comfortable with awkward silence Ooh. and I'm going to go, Hey, I'm going to ask you a question and know that if I don't respond right away, it, it's because I just want to sit and actually process what you just said. That is not something that I would ever naturally do. Yeah. Well, I'm I glad you're good with awkward silence given my internet connection tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's but super like, cool like, though. Cause I, yeah. I've wondered that. Cause I thought given Grant's experiences, you know, went in school and everything we were talking about since I thought, I bet it's the same kind of thing you learned outside of the classroom. Yeah. The inside of the classroom stuff gives you um, the educational background to go, Oh no, 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 I know what you're talking about. Let me walk through that with you. And then the experience of how that's applied in the, in the real world is all the other stuff. And that is, that is invaluable. And that's, that's leadership. Um, one of my, my favorite sayings about followers of Jesus is most of us are already educated beyond our level of obedience. Mm. And so I'm like, listen, I could, I, I have the academic credentials to do another Bible study for you. Why don't you go start applying what God has already taught you to do? And then let's talk. Yeah. yeah. I don't, awesome. I don't think a lot of, in, in specifically in the Bible belt, right? Like yeah. people don't need a lot more theology. They need to apply the theology they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very so good way your, of putting in it. In your consulting with, with churches, is there certain things that you see keep popping up that, that churches are trying to address and struggling to address? Yeah, I, it depends on, on, on 
the category you want to put it in, but I, the thing that I'm harping on and, and paying attention to a lot right now is humility and repentance in the church. Mm. And whether that is, and, and I think this in an appropriate way, um, American evangelicalism has been hijacked through political systems in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, um, and I don't mean that to be a political statement. I, I, I just mean that is, is it seems to have been hijacked and the church was culpable in some of that. And so now with a new generation that is very skeptical of the church, um, that generation of nuns, right, that we know that are coming, N-O-N-E-S, when I can approach as a pastor and go, hey, that hard question that you have or that, that thing that you are accusing the church of, you're right. Yeah. And that's not okay. And I don't have to defend that. And, and it takes this a level of uncommon humility before the world. And that's, that's what the world really values. Um, and then repentance, like this is going to this sound, this sounds like, I don't, I don't mean it to sound dramatic, but like when Martin Luther left the Catholic church, he was not trying to leave the Catholic church. Yeah. He was trying to call the Catholic church out. And the mm -hmm. first three, if you look at his 95 thesis, the first three have to do with repentance. Yeah. There's just something about as pastors, if we could take a repentant heart. And, and so when I get, sadly, when, when our team gets called into a lot of these situations, it's when things have already gone poorly. Mm -hmm. And we're like, man, if, if you had just had some leadership, some elders, some lead pastors that were willing to leave in lead in vulnerability, humility, and repentance, mm -hmm. I don't think we'd be here. I just don't think we'd be here. And so if there's anything that, that I am interested in right now is this, how do I be a man that leads out in those ways as well, that um, is willing to say, I'm sorry. And you know what? You're right. I, I totally shouldn't have done that. And, the amount, and then the, the, the flip side of this is the church's responsibility to then give grace in that moment. Yeah. We're really good at eating our own. Yeah. Um, and we've seen a lot of bad repentance. And so we need to see some good repentance. And then we need to give grace in those moments that doesn't mean there's not discipline for the things that were done but that we can still give grace and not eat our own and so that's a lot of what i try to to, to get people through. and that comes through communication it comes mm -hmm. through uh, communication styles comes through apology everybody receives apologies different like I, I could there's a ton there but i think humility and repentance are just these two things that i keep going oh if we could just do that better yeah i think I think the church would have um, a larger voice. Let's just say if the United Methodist Church had listened to the last four minutes of this podcast, they might not have just lost like 80% of their members of the global Methodists. <laughs> I mean, it's, and, and I, I'm not even kidding. Cause I, I'm in, I'm in a brand new global Methodist church. We, we, it was, we just unanimously voted to go, but it was, it's not for the reasons that you hear about in the news or on Twitter. And it's really, it, I would say like 90% of it boils down to everything you just said and in leadership. And there's, there's a lot to that. Yeah. 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 And I, I guys, I, I'm not perfect in it, but I'm trying to, to demonstrate that and lead down in it. And my wife has, has probably been the one that's taught me a lot about that. Um, she, she's, she's the first one to apologize for, to our kids when mom and dad do something that we're not supposed to do, which is just like, Oh my gosh, what a fantastic example to set for our children of like, hey, the way that we want you to apologize to us when you sin against us, we're going to apologize to you when we sin against you. And we're going to both practice grace. And, and that's, that's just this fantastic thing in our family that Jenna has taught us. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah, I, I was going to say too, for the church situation I've been at the last, I guess, four years now that I've been here in New Braunfels, everything you just said resonated so much um mm. through a period of transition that we we've kind of we're coming out of right now um we probably could have used that talk too <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah that's, that's it, powerful. I, that totally resonates yeah and it's it really and, and and that that's part of my heart because i'm like how do we teach um, men and women that are pastors to like live this sooner yeah. Um, I don't want to be the guy that gets, gets called in when things go poorly. Um, there, there's a really great book uh, called uh, The Trillion Dollar Coach. Um, and it's, it's all about coaching. It's a guy named Bill Campbell, who 
was the coach to Silicon Valley. Like basically there was a season in his life. He's passed now, but if you were the who's who of Silicon Valley, like at, the reason that the book is called trillion dollar coach is they looked up at his funeral and they were like, here's the Apple guys and the Google guys and the Facebook guys. And they're like, there's a trillion dollars net worth in this room. Wow. He coached every single one of them and you've never heard of his name. Wow. Right. You've never heard of his name. And it's because the CEOs of these companies who, you know, were, I'm not going to say humble because I don't know that it, it was humility. They were wise enough to say, I need some help and I need somebody to bounce things off of that are going to shoot me straight yeah. and help me out with that. I think it's so that now let me translate to the church. I go, now let's call it humility to say, let's lay down my arrogance and pride that I may be called to be a pastor, but I'm not, I don't have it all figured out. And so I don't have a direct line to God. What would it look like for you to invite outside voices in to help hold you accountable? If Silicon Valley has figured that out, why can't we in the church? Um, and so that's what I'm exploring right now. And what I get to do um, very, very humbly, which is why I'm like, guys, I'm not the expert on any of this, but I love to see the kingdom of God thrive. So how can I do that? That's incredible. Is that what you're, uh, is that related to what you're working at, at with your doctorate? Yeah, so I, I was joking earlier about my doctorate. Um, I'm on my third topic for my thesis. There's a whole nice. dumb story why. Um, but the current one is is really around this idea of repentance. Wow. Um, and and what does that what does it look like for a cohort of pastors to gather together and practice repentance with each other? And it's scary that it's vulnerable and we all feel like we're gonna lose our jobs. Yeah. Gosh, I want to change that. I want to change that. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. There are a couple of questions that we normally ask every guest, but I want to see if you have any more, you know, regarding church or anything before we jump to those. No, I could probably go on forever. Yeah. But we're already at an hour. <laughs> it's also, it's, a, it's also, <laughs> very, let's, let's you and I just connect. We could totally do that. I would actually appreciate that. Awesome. Absolutely, man. Anytime. Well, two, two that we ask each guest. Uh, one is what is a tradition? Cause we talk about, you know, what everything people are involved with. What is something back at UMHB that you wish you had gotten to be involved with that you never really got a chance to be involved with? Oh, <laughs> it's hard to ask that to somebody who like was involved with everything. <laughs> no, like, like legitimately I'm like, <laughs> what did I not? This is fun. like now, like I guys, I did everything. I did Easter pageant. I was the thief that went to hell three years in a row. Oh yeah. I followed um, you in that role uh, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I got to be a part of that. I helped lead worship at, at chapel and do gazebo worship. I was, I got to MC almost every event. Like, like I literally get to just look back on my time at Mayor and Baylor. And I was like, I was in intramurals. I, I just dove in and did all of it. Um, That's amazing. I, you know, so I don't, I don't, I have no regrets about not being involved with something. Um, that was there. I, I just genuinely, I mean, maybe, 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 maybe it would be, and I'm stretching to get there is I, I regret that I wasn't there my freshman year. Mm -hmm. Um, because coming in as a transfer student, everybody has relationships already and you kind of have to work your way in, um, to those. And it, my personality, I did, and it was great. Sounds but, like you just fine. <laughs> um, right. But I mean, it's, it's, I'm like, it's a stretch. But yeah. like, I just, guys, I just thoroughly enjoyed it, my time there. And I, I don't think I'd redo anything differently. Um, well, I can, I mean, I some can decisions I made, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that just means you had fun in college. I, I would say, you know, I, I can attribute to that to a, I, knowing you in high school, I'm like, that's not surprising at all. And B, you know, and I've told Tyler this kind of before off air, it's like in Canyon, there was sort of this weird expectation where, you know, you don't get picked on for being in band. You don't get picked on for being in the chess club as long as you're competing and kicking some other school's butt at it. Like that was the expectation in that town. It's like, there's a place yeah. for everybody. You just got to compete at it. That's and cool. it's that involvement I think carries on. I think it's like, after you left, I was kind of the same way. I was like, if I'm going to be at a small school, I'm going to do everything here. Um, but Tyler, you got, yeah, you got my the biggest other... regret is that I, I joined up with everything, but then dropped out of everything. I was, <laughs> I was like, be in the crusader and I would like three or four times every time. I'm like, ah, this takes too much time. I'm out. Yeah. You know, that's why I was laughing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can tell Grant how you actually, you, you didn't quite go down with the ship with couch crew. 
You, oh, that's true. I yeah, no, even you're right. Even Couch Crew, I quit because it was the last season of Couch Crew. I turned around and there were less people behind us than there were captains. And I'm and my own girlfriend at the time wouldn't sit with me because she was embarrassed by it. So I'm like, you know what? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> he quit at halftime yeah. and he calls me to tell me, and I'm like, sounds about right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. I didn't quite go down with the ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ship was underwater by that point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you want to get, you can grab the other question. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if this one, uh, what's the, uh, what is the next question? Like not including the stag bowl, uh, game. What is your favorite sports related memory from UMHB? Yeah. Um, stag bowl, as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty high up there. Um, the story I probably tell a lot. Um, so my wife played played golf um, there, and and we we went to Top Golf the other day. She still got it. Nice. Um, we went to golf. She stopped playing golf after her sophomore year, and because um, she was an accounting major, and you have to like actually pay attention to that. She's like the the degree is why I'm here. Um, and so she she stopped playing golf not because she didn't love um, the golf team and, and her experiences there. It was just her degree de- required more of her. Um, but I love to brag on her because she would never brag on herself. And um, I'm sh- go back and look at the stats. I may get this wrong a little bit because I'm a storyteller and it's my wife and all of those things. But um, if memory serves appropriately, and the way I tell the story is her sophomore year, they went to nationals. And they ended up for the first time in a long time getting second place at nationals. Um, And I think they, they lost, they got second by seven strokes. Mm. Um, And it's a team sport at that. It's a team sport at that where it's, there's no individual winners, but if you look at nationals at the individual winners um, and their scores, my wife got first place by seven, by seven strokes. Wow. And so like it stunk for the team um, who was made up of some fantastic golf um, uh, ladies that, that we, we love to follow and walk the courses with, but there's just that moment of like, Oh, my wife's really good at golf. <laughs> um, we got second place by seven strokes and she, although she doesn't have a trophy for it, won nationals at D three by seven strokes. Um, wow. I didn't get to go, go watch her and do that, but that's, it's one of my things when, when she talks about her time there and I'm, and she's like, yeah, I played golf. I'm like, no, 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 no. You didn't just play golf. Like you were good <laughs> at golf. So that's, that's a great answer to that question. That's that might be one of my favorites for that. Yeah, yeah me yeah, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, dude, I am glad we got to do this. Cause I, this, like I said, at the beginning, oh, this, this is so this fun was, guys. This was like bucket list interview for this podcast when we started putting it together and, just like one of my favorite things about this podcast, getting to see people I haven't got to see in person in ages. And so getting to realize right. in my head, like, wow, I've known this guy 20 years, you know, it like blew my and, mind. And like, this is one of those moments for me that I love where like, I don't know if we've met maybe, maybe briefly, I doubt it, but I know we've had so much interactions on Garrett's Facebook comment threads <laughs> and, different things throughout the years. and I've heard so many stories. So it's great to finally like put a real face to a name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Know. Likewise, Tyler. Awesome. Well, Grant, do me a That's favor. Tell, well, guys, thanks. Tell your wife, tell your family hello for me. I haven't haven't seen any of the Hickmans in years, but just great, great, solid folks. Be sure to tell them hi for Man, me. Man, absolutely. And and I would tell you, if you're ever up in Portland, guys, holler at us um, right behind uh, my wall there. So we live on four and a half acres out here because we have six kids that need to run around. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a, there's a little guest house right behind me right there. Um, we have somebody living with us full time right now that they're moving out in the next couple of months as they get um, to their next. And so if you're ever in the area, man, holler at us. We love to host people. Cool. I've been wanting um, to go to and, and love to so do it. Long. <laughs> I, uh, I actually, come on, man, me and my wife, were trying to plan our summer vacation. And, uh, I was like, why don't we do yes. Portland? We, I, we love to hike. We love beer. We love soccer. Like there's a lot going on there. And she was like, eh, I don't know. And so I was at work trying to learn the new Prezi because I've been using the old one for so long. And so I'm like, okay, I really got to learn it. So like I spent the day just figuring out how to learn it by putting together this whole like presentation for why we should go to Portland. 
<laughs> and we get through it all. And she was like, that was a really good presentation. <laughs> wow. You learned that. I'm like, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So uh, what about Portland? She goes, I don't know. <laughs> hey, now you can just add one more slide at the end. Now you've got a video clip. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I'll add this then for next time. Dude, come on. And it it's Portland. Um, it's crazy that the, the city itself is a little bit bonkers right now. We've all seen the news. That's also like a three block radius. So it's the news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but man, there's just, there's, there's great people up here. We, we go hiking all the time. Every weekend we've got stand up paddle boards. We take them out on lakes and the rivers. We'd love to, to host you anytime, Tyler. Come on. You too, Garrett. Awesome. We'll do. Cool. We'll cool. Do. <laughs> Grant. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. This was fun. Yeah, guys, thank you. It was an honor. Um, seriously, it's it's a privilege that I would even get to jump on a podcast like this. So thank you, guys. Oh, this was great. Anytime. That was a fun episode. I uh, knew it would I be. I really didn't know what to expect going in. Um, to be honest, I didn't know Grant was in ministry. So yeah. that that ending was was real exciting for me to just be <laughs> out of professional curiosity. Uh, but yeah, dude, he uh, he definitely had a say yes attitude. Um, yeah. and just get involved in everything that's what's i think cool about umhb and small colleges like it that you can get involved in so many different activities you know well and it's also cool that i as we figured out during the episode our next guest is also from canyon texas that's and we right. will probably be talking some ministry with him too so. yeah i know i know that's why i almost had to like you know halted on the ministry talk because we're, we're about <laughs> to have a whole episode of of ministry next week uh <laughs> getting to talk about minute being a ministry major and then just life in ministry and how that education helped us, you know, and the people that we met, like Sean Shannon, you know, like mm -hmm. we just heard about. It's incredible. I want to ask him how in the world he was a preview student during one of our Friar Tuck dare nights and he still chose to go to school there. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's that'll be a good story. To we hear. will get to that one next week, folks. All right. Well, well as for this then, week, as always, it's what is it? Nine it's eight, 9 18 p.m. in HSU. Still, still sucks. sucks.